And we are learning chapter 12, the chapter of the Benoni. We've begun to discover what the Benoni is all about. We're going to find that the more we learn about the Benoni, on the one hand, the clearer it becomes. And yet on the other hand, we're going to also discover that the Benoni is very much not what we had uh, always believed or what we had always thought. The more we learn about the Benoni, the more respect we have for the Benoni, the more we wish we could be a Benoni. <laughs> the more we realize that there's a long way to go to become a Benoni. So this is a very important part of our personal development as you know, as we learn all of this very, very important information. So what do we know so far? Well, the first thing that might have taken us by surprise is the fact that the definition of a Benoni is somebody who is absolutely focused on doing what Hashem wants, thinking as Hashem would want them to think, and speaking as Hashem would want them to speak. That is the definition of a Benoni. And the big surprise was that loy ovar avera miyomov veloy yavor. That this is somebody who has never done an avera, never sinned, and never will sin. And we had to talk about that, obviously, because we said. That's not possible. You're not born as a Benoni. So how does that work? And we came to the conclusion that a Benoni obviously has done a very, very powerful form of teshuva, which completely eradicates anything negative as if it was never there. In fact, uh, possibly even converts it into becoming something which is positive. And therefore, you could use the expression, you could say that the Benoni is somebody who never uh, does anything wrong or has never in their history ever done anything wrong because the history has now been completely cleared or converted into something positive. Last week, we began to explore how the Benoni on occasion can have an experience where it, he feels like a tzaddik. It was very interesting because after the shir, when, uh, when we went offline, for those of us who were here in person, there was a whole conversation afterwards about the fact that the Benoni during the t- time of davening could feel like a tzaddik. So somebody misunderstood that to mean, oh, so what you're saying is, that a tzaddik feels that they are a tzaddik. That wasn't the point at all. The point was that a benoni could have an experience, and during that experience, he experiences what it is like to be a tzaddik. He feels what it feels like if one is a tzaddik, not feels conscious of his own spiritual achievements or, or spiritual level. So I just wanted to clarify that because it came up last week. So when is it that the benoni has this temporary experience of tzaddikhood or a tzaddik-esque reality during the key points of the davening specifically the shema and the amida those are the centerpieces of the whole davening they're very very important parts of what uh, our whole um, prayer experience is there are pl- times for us to connect there are times that we're supposed to be meditative and so that's where the opportunity strikes for the vein need to have an experience of what it is to be a tzaddik and one of the expressions that we lo- used last week and I mentioned the fact that we were going to have to come back and, and really understand what this expression means, is we said that during the period of saying the Shema here in the human experience, we know that there's a very specific uh, specific time uh, when you have to say the Shema. So there's, there's kind of bookends. You have to say the Shema later than a certain time and earlier than at another time. So it's within that framework. That's not accidental. The fact that Hashem has designed the world in a particular way, that we have to daven at a particular time, that is because the energy of that particular time is suited to what this segment of davening is supposed to achieve. So what the Shema is supposed to achieve is reflected, or is reflective of what's going on in the world at that time. So we, that's what we started to talk about last week. And there was a phrase that we used which we're going to unpack. However, before that, somebody just asked a question. I've explained how the Benoni is considered like they had never sinned in the past. And that makes sense because they've done tshuva. So therefore, it makes sense that whatever previously might have constituted a sin is no longer on their record. When I look at this person, I see a person who could never have sinned, which is exactly why we could use the expression regarding the future as well. As they are now in this particular freeze frame of time, they are not ever going to sin. What's going to happen in the next moment? I don't know what's going to happen in the next moment. But not my analysis of this person, and it's not about you and me and analyzing this person, a, an objective, truthful analysis of this person. In other words, Hashem analyzing the person, as the Rambam says, your dear Talumo is Hashem who knows what's really going, going on inside our hearts. At this particular point in time, the, this uh, snapshot of time, this cross section of time, when we look at the Benoni, at this point, the Benoni is incapable of sin. 
Let's talk about that for a moment, and then we'll, we'll circle back to what it is about the Shema in that time of the davening and what's going on in the spiritual realms. But let's just talk about this for a second. What does it mean you could never sin at that particular time? Okay, so let's think about it. Have you ever had this kind of an experience? What kind of an experience? Let's say that it is, for example, Yom Kippur. Okay, <laughs> so that's a that's a very relatable experience of uh, of deep connection. Yom Kippur. So you're sitting there on Yom Kippur. You're sitting in shul. You've been there since the morning. You're very focused. You've done all the things that you're supposed to do. You've davened all the sections that you're supposed to daven. And now it comes to that moment at the end of Ne'ilah. This is the crescendo of Yom Kippur. Everybody's been building to this point. And we all stand up. Because in, at Ne'ilah we generally stand for the, the whole of Ne'ilah. And even if a person cannot, usually at the end everybody's standing up. And we shout as a community, Shema Yisrael Hashem Elokeinu Hashem Echad. And we shout as a community, Hashem Hu Ha'ilekim, seven times, Hashem Hu Ha'ilekim. If, if you belong to a half-decent community, which I think we all do, that is this electrified moment where there is so much energy and there is so much power and there is so much connection that in that moment you feel, I'll never ever be the same. I'll never do an Avera again. That's how, that's how you imagine yourself to be. Okay, so it might just be a little bit idealistic on our part to think that because I'm swept up in the emotion of the moment, therefore I'm never going to sin again. But the reality is, if we could freeze frame life at that point in time, if we could extract it, imagine we could like fly into Ni'ila and pull a person out of Ni'ila. Uh, it's a horrible example to use, but let's say, God forbid, a person passed away at that time saying, Hashem, hu hoi lekim. They would leave this world as a person who's never going to sin again. <laughs> That's the reality. So the Benoni is, is like that. The Benoni is somebody, as long as they hold the status of Benoni, which is something we're still going to unpack in a lot more detail, but as long as the person holds the status of Benoni, they will not sin. God forbid they let it slide because a benoni is not a guarantee. It's not like a tzaddik where if a person is a tzaddik, they are a tzaddik in the long term. It's possible that a benoni could, for whatever reason, lose their grip on their spirituality. Okay, fine. So if the benoni backslides, then they're no longer benoni. But as a benoni, as a benoni, the person will not sin. Okay, so that was just to address that question. Let's come back to what we're talking about now which is what we left off with last week, that during the time that we here on earth are expected to say the Shema, that's designed to match what's going on in the spiritual realms. Whatever we're doing on earth is always a mirror of what's going on in the heavenly realms. So, for example, why is Shabbos a day of rest for humans? Because in spiritual terms, Shabbos, the energy of Shabbos, is an energy of rest which is different to the dynamic energy of the rest of the week. Dynamic meaning that things are in process and, and things are being done and being achieved. Why is it that we're supposed to eat matzah? Okay, today was Pesach Sheini, so I guess there's a little bit of a carryover of matzah. But why is it that we eat matzah on the first night of Pesach, which is what's mandated by the Torah, outside of Israel, the first two nights of Pesach? Because the rest of Pesach, you don't have to eat matzah. As long as you avoid eating comets, you're fine. But the first night of Pesach, you're required to eat matzah. Why? Because the energy in the supernal realms at that time, during those particular hours, is an energy of everything that matzah represents, which is freedom and absolute submission to Hashem and the ability to do things without feeling the self-satisfaction, like when you eat matzah and you don't necessarily get the, the, uh, the feedback, the taste feedback from the matzah that you would normally get from other food, etc., etc. Whatever the matzah represents, that's the energy at that time. So why is it that the Torah expects us to say the Shema between this hour and that hour? Because the energy of whatever is supposed to happen in our experience, or at least what there is the potential for it to happen in our experience, that is the energy that is generated, that is flowing in the spiritual realms at that particular time. So what is the energy associated with the Shema? He tells us, the Alter Rebbe tells us, is Moichin de Gadlus. That was the expression. We, we didn't really have the time last week to explore it properly, understand what this concept is. Moichin de Gadlus. 
if we have to translate, moichin is brains, literally, a moyach is a brain, and godless is greatness. So the most hackneyed but probably direct translation of moichin to godless would be great intellect. It is a time of great intellect in the spiritual realms, and therefore there's an invitation for us to have a profoundly intellectual experience of our connection to Hashem during that time. Now, what does that mean when we talk about great intellect? Now, first of all, you can imagine that if there's moichin de gadlus, if there's a variation of intellect that is great, the implication is there's moichin de katnus also. There must be a limited or smaller or less mature version of intellect. Must be. And let's not forget that there's the possibility of no moichin at all, <laughs> which is that a person is behaving in a way that is not guided by intellect. We're not putting that onto the menu over here because we're talking about healthy states. So in a healthy state of connection, in a healthy state of personal development, it's moichin de katnos, there's the minor intellect, or moichin de gadlos, the major intellect. Where there's no intellect, that's when a person is not in a state of spiritual development and growth, when a person is not in a state of connection mindlessness or impulsive behavior or just reacting to things in an emotional fashion without a sense of the guidance of intellect. Okay, so that's important. So what is moichin? What is moichin de gadlus? And what, what is moichin de katnus? This is what we have to understand in order to appreciate what the power of the time of the Shema is. So we think about ourselves, because we, before we can understand how things work in the heavenly realms, let's understand how they work within our own world. And from our world, the verse tells us that from observing my own flesh, I can see how Hashem operates. So if we understand how we operate, it gives us a tremendous insight into how Hashem designed the world, because we are created in His image. The human being is, generally speaking, divided into three segments. Roish, Guf, Regel. You look at the human anatomy, there's the head, the torso, and the legs. That's the general division of how we understand the, you know, the, the main types of functions of a human being. In the head region is where you have the most complex and advanced uh, facilities of the, of the human being. So you've got the brain which obviously is by far the most complex and advanced element of the human experience. You have the eyes. Well, for visual processing is one of the most important parts of the human experience. You have the ears, you have the nose, you have the mouth. This is how we engage with the world, it's how we take the world in, it's how we share with the world. Then you have the torso, which contains vital organs that keep us alive, like the heart and the lungs and the kidneys and the digestive system and the liver, etc., and the spine. These are the parts that keep us alive. Which is effectively, effectively, if you think about it, the battery pack. <laughs> it's not necessarily the most complex version of the human being. So, I don't know if you ever heard the, the story about a whole lot of doctors at a dinner party. I, I don't know if it's a true story, but I suspect that it's a regular conversation. So, in our world, cardiologists are a big deal because... So many people need the care of cardiologists. They're considered a really big deal. But in the medical world, the neurologists look down their nose at the cardiologists because they say, effectively, you spent X amount of years learning how to manage a pump. <laughs> and we're trying to run a supercomputer that nobody really understands. So the difference between a vital organ and a complex organ is very different. Even if you think about it, the complexity of the human eye is more than the complexity of the human heart. Because the human heart really is just, just a, a series of muscles that, that have one job to do, pump. Whereas the eye has to be able to dis discern a whole spectrum and range of colors and hues and frequencies. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's very different. So what's in the head region of the human being is typically the most advanced, most complex, most mature versions of the human. What's in the torso area are the most fundamental to survival. And then the legs area is really just functionary. You need to be able to get places, so you've got, a, you've got legs to get you places. So, you know, that, that's effectively the part of the human being that 
God forbid a person should never have to surrender, but it is possible to live without. That reflects the three major areas of human experience. The lowest level of human experience is exactly that, experience. For example, right now you are sitting. That is a human experience. It's a very tactile, real human experience. You don't have to start explaining it to somebody else. Nobody sits down with a friend over coffee and says, Nu, how are you sitting? It's a universal experience. We know what it is. It's, it's like the legs. Everybody's got the same experience. You sit, yes, for one person, they're more comfortable when they sit. Another person is less comfortable. This person's got sciatica. That person uh, has ADD. Okay, fine. So the sitting experience is not absolutely universal. But as a human experience, it's not a particularly deep human experience. I thought of you sitting. So anything that works in that world of experience universal human experience that's like the legs it's the least sophisticated part of the human being the torso is going to represent feelings what we call in the language of Hasidus, we call midois midois are your characteristics your traits yes of course you'll sit down with somebody over coffee and say tell me how are you feeling how are you doing you look a little tired. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> that's, that's what happens. This is a much more nuanced, complex part of the human experience. Even if you had two people. And both of those people say, right now I am happy. There could be absolutely nothing in common between the two experiences of happiness. One person could be happy because... They've just gotten over the flu, so they're happy to be feeling good again. And the other person could be happy because their, their, their sister just got engaged. <laughs> we use the same word. It is describing the same emotion. But emotions are so broad and so diverse and so complex and so nuanced that not necessarily when you use the, the term, is it a one-size-fits-all or, or anybody even has the same experience. So midois are a far more developed part of the human experience. Far more developed, far more uh, fluid. You know, every time you sit in the same chair, it's pretty much the same experience <laughs> physically. But if you sit in the same chair and you have different things going on around you, the emotional experience could be completely different. Now the nature of midois is that they are typically reactionary and often impulsive. In other words... When your reminder goes off in your calendar to say, Tanya Shir, it's Wednesday evening, you'll have a reaction to that. And very often it will be an impulsive reaction. So your impulsive reaction could be, oh my gosh, I can't believe it's already Wednesday evening. The week is over. And what did I achieve? And all the stuff that brings up, which actually has nothing to do with the Tanya Shir, but it's just a reaction that we have. There's a sentimental reaction that we have to the fact that this is the time of the week. Another person's reaction might be, Baruch Hashem, it's exactly what I need. I've had such a rough week. I need something that's uplifting, something that is wise, something that is deep. The person giving the shir might say, Oy vey, I didn't get a chance to even look at the Tanya for this week. What am I going to do? Okay, so the point being, that midois are reactionary. Something's going on to stimulate a midois response from us. The upside of that is that it's often very authentic. And the downside is that it's often very authentic. <laughs> the downside is that it's often a little bit primitive. Our reactions are often a little bit primitive. And anybody who's paying attention to, to themselves and to their reactions... We'll, we'll pick up sometimes, oh my, is that really how I'm responding to this? So you get into your car. Ever had this experience? You get into your car and you turn the ignition and nothing happens. 
So 99% of the time, the response that we have is midois. Very few people turn the ignition, the car doesn't start, and they become philosophical. I wonder what message Hashem is trying to send me now. The average person turns the ignition, the car doesn't start, default reaction is, Ah, nothing ever works. I'm having a horrible day. I'm going to be late for this thing. It's going to be a disaster. Why does this always happen to me? That's the problem with Midos. Midos are authentic, but they're quite primitive. Moichin, that's the head area. Intellect. Intellect is more analytical. Intellect doesn't just get swept in the it's swept up in the, the response. Okay, what's happening? How do I respond? Intellect is measured, patient, thorough. So, for example, that person is sitting, trying to turn the car, trying to start their car. If they were a deeply intellectual person, they'd be saying, okay, let me just think about this. Why is the car not starting? Did I maybe forget to close the door and the light was on the whole night and the battery's dead? So then it's not a big deal. I'll just get the jumper cables and I'll connect to somebody else's car and I'll get the car started. Is it maybe a little bit cold because there's been a change in weather? Okay, so I'm going to try one or two more times just to you know heat up the engine, whatever it is. So the world of intellect is really different to the world of emotion or the world of meadows because it is not reactionary. I don't have to wait for something to happen before I could be intellectual. I can choose to be intellectual prophylactically, right? I, I could start in advance and say, I, I'm going to actually work on myself to have an intellectual approach or to have a particular a, 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 an attitude or a particular perspective on something that may or may not happen in my life. So one of the greatest things about being human is that the mind is designed to direct and control the heart. And we call that moyach shalit al halev, that the brain has the capacity to rule over the heart. And that's a strong word, to rule over the heart. Because the heart is impulsive, and it could, you know, the emotions are impulsive, and they could just explode. So you need that kind of strength of focus and of direction. Moyach shalit al halev. So let me ask you an interesting question. It is true and accurate to say that intellect has the capacity, the natural capacity, to manage contextualize, restrain, direct, whichever word you want to use, emotions. 100%, that is something that intellect can do. Here's the question. Is that why we have a brain? Meaning an intellectual brain. Is that the reason we have a brain? To be able to control our emotions. It's an interesting question. So, so maybe don't, uh, don't rush into an answer, but just think about it for a second. What do you think? So it's factual that the nature of our intellect is that it is empowered to direct and focus and control our outbursts, our emotional outbursts, our midois. Fact. Nobody's denying that fact. Is that why we have an intellectual brain? In other words, is that the purpose of the intellectual brain? To be able to control us. Any thoughts? Everybody's mulling this over. Hmm? No? You know why nobody's answering, answering immediately? Because nobody wants to be accused of being reactionary and giving a midois based answer. And everybody would much prefer to say, I'm thinking because I want to give a moichin based answer, which would be much more suited to this particular question. Okay, that's fair. That's, that's fair. <laughs> <laughs> What's that? The brain. Yes. Exactly. I mean, it's there for your learning and studying. And exactly. Studying. Exactly. The brain is way more, way more than just being able to do whatever, you know, you need for self-control. We don't begin to appreciate the complexity and the power of the human brain with all of the research, with all of the medical studies, with all of the science, 
we actually, it's the one organ we really don't fully understand. We don't even begin to fully understand. And that's why we have this whole genre of mind power and the fact that if you focus and you use your mind, you can achieve things that perhaps everybody else would have said you cannot achieve. I heard a fascinating story today about an individual who was given a particular diagnosis by a doctor. This is, I heard this today firsthand. They were given a particular diagnosis by a doctor. And the, the, the only saving grace is that the doctor didn't tell them the diagnosis. They told their family members the diagnosis. And it was a very, very harsh diagnosis. The family members went back to the patient and said the exact opposite of what the doctor had said. In other words, the doctor said in their condition, they would have X and Y happen to them. The family went back to the patient and said, we've just spoken to the doctor. And the doctor said, because of the nature of what you had, the problem you're currently experiencing is going to reverse naturally because of your, because of the particular condition. I, you know, if, I, if I could give you more information, it would make a lot more sense. And so the patient never knew the dire prediction of the doctor. And that individual today still doesn't know and lives as if there was never that prediction. And meaning to say they reversed the medical condition as the kids had told them <laughs> in spite of the doctor's prognosis. We don't understand the power of the mind. We don't understand. So to, to reduce the mind simply to being a controller of the emotions is, not, is to do a disservice to the mind. Is that a massive component of what our brain can do? Yes. Is it a massive component of what distinguishes us from animals? Yes. There is no such thing as an animal that can have moyach sholit al halev. A hungry lion that's on the hunt is not going to sit there and say, you know what? Nebuch, that impala looks like he's had a rough week. I'm going to leave him. It's not possible. So it's a massive part of the human experience, but it is not what Moichin is all about. Therefore, we split Moichin into two realities. Moichin de Katnus, the minor version of intellect. Moichin de Gadlus, the major version of intellect. What's the difference? So somebody put over here in the chat that uh, the purpose of the mind is to be able to meditate on Hashem with Moichin de Gadlus, which is very close to what we're going to be talking about. I'm just always wary of the word meditation because people associate it with something where you clear your mind, whereas Hasidus talks very much about his Boinanus, which is contemplation, where you fill your mind. So I just want to make that distinction. So, so Moichin de Katnus, we are now going to understand this a little differently to how we would have originally. Originally, we understood that Moichin de Katnos is immature intellect, and Moichin de Gadlos is mature intellect. And that's valid, and I'm not dismissing it as a definition. It's a valid definition. But, uh, oh, good. <laughs> Spelling error, not meditate, mediate. So to mediate our midos. Okay, good point. Um, anyway, so Moichin de Katnos who said immature, and Moichin de Gadlos mature, he has another way to look at it. If I look at the model of Roish, Guf, Regel, or in the reverse, Regel, Guf, Roish, the legs, the torso, and the, and the head, or the brain. Well, let's say the head because it contains other faculties besides the brain. So what I'm seeing is which of those three is the greatest and which is the smallest. Now, the way I'm going to measure that is the level of complexity, the variety of things that it could achieve. Then I'm going to have to say the leg region is the smallest, meaning you say the most narrow range of possibilities. Even when you compare feet to hands, the dexterity of toes is nothing like the dexterity of fingers. So legs are katnus. Katnus doesn't necessarily only mean immature. It means very limited in terms of what they could achieve or how developed and complex the system is. So if I'm comparing the region of the vital organs to the legs, then I'll say legs are katnus and vital organs are gadlus because they are critical to survival and they are more complex systems. The digestive system, for example, is a highly complex system, the filtration of the, of the kidneys, etc. 
But if I'm comparing the goof area, the torso, to the head area, then the torso area is cutnose. It's much more limited in terms of range and sophistication compared to, say, the brain. By the same token, midois are very powerful, like the, like the heart is a very powerful muscle. Midois are very powerful, but they are cutnose. They are far more limited in range and sophistication than the brain is. Let's use a, a, a parable to illustrate this. So let's just say, uh, I don't know, who's the biggest genius in the room? <laughs> Rowan. So, <laughs> so let's say you've got somebody who is an incredible genius, right? And now they have to talk to somebody who is not nearly at their intellectual level. So a parent speaking to a child is exactly that. A parent typically should have a more developed intellect than the child, a more mature perspective on the world than the child. But now the parent has to speak to the child. If I don't know who you're talking to, if I'm eavesdropping from outside your house when you're speaking to your child, the impression that I might get about you is, hmm, you're a little bit limited. <laughs> That's how you talk? That's how you explain things? That's the vocabulary that you use. So I get the impression that you are cotton, that you are small, you're limited, you're, you know, you've got your, your lack of sophistication. And the truth is that's not the fact. It's just in that role to be able to explain something to a person who knows far less or doesn't yet have that maturity or doesn't yet have that life experience, you have to reduce what you're sharing, simplify cull a whole lot of information that you're not going to share. So when you're talking to your child, you're in a state of moichin de katnus. Your intellect is being simplified. It's being almost dumbed down. It's not a nice way to say it. But it's, it's being simplified so that you can communicate with somebody who's not as developed. When you are with adult company, then you could be moichin de gadlos. You could speak at your level of maturity, especially if you're speaking to people who are in the same uh, industry as you're in. So now you can use language that they're familiar with and the kind of, you know, the, the jargon that nobody else knows. And you can make references that people won't recognize. So now you could be you. There's no limits on your mind. In the same way, when the brain is being employed to direct and control the midois, it's kind of whittled down to a more a basic version of the brain, like the self-control version of the brain or the, the direction or the disciplinarian part of the brain. It's very valuable, but at that point, the brain is not behaving as an intellectual. The brain is behaving possibly as a teacher, as a guide, as a coach, as a mentor, whichever word you want to use, but not a pure intellectual. When the brain is learning... When the brain is exploring, that's more moichin de gadlos. I'm not learning this so that I can mediate behavior. I'm not learning this so that I won't have an outburst the next time the, 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 the line at the checkout counter is longer than I'd like. I'm learning this because there's value in learning. Because the intellectual process is a mature, elevated process. That's why I'm learning. So what that means is, Moichin de Katnos is a description of the intellect plugged in to the Midois. Moichin de Gadlos is a description of the intellect free of any other responsibilities or concerns. It's a pure form of intellect. Now, if we want to be able to have a relationship with Hashem, in order to have that relationship with Hashem, we have to start from a place of understanding because you can't really have a meaningful relationship with something or someone you understand nothing about. So that's why we contemplate Hashem's greatness during the course of the davening. And if you have a look at the map of the davening, that's what we do. In fact, it's a very clear template of, of how it works. We spoke a little bit about this last time with the ladder. So you start off at the beginning of the prayers by basically saying, you know what, Hashem is great because he looks after me. And if you understood what an important thing that was, you would also praise him. You know, the fact that it, the, the whole world should celebrate the fact that I woke up again this morning. 
So if Hashem gave me what I needed to go through the morning blessings, He allowed me to stand up, He allowed me to have clothing, He allowed me, etc., etc., that is a cause for celebration. Then we mature through the course of the davening and we start to say, you know what? Hashem's greatness is not bound by what he does for me. Hashem's greatness is a matter of how he runs the world. And then we start talking about the, the wonders of creation and the expanse of creation because that broadens our mind to understanding a whole different perspective of how Hashem is really great. And then we be, go beyond that and we say, well, get, guess what? That's only the things that we can observe. So we might have a Hubble telescope or we might have some kind of super microscope and so we can see things in the world and that impresses us about Hashem greatness but the truth of the matter is that if you speak to the world of the angels they're going kadosh 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 they're speaking about Hashem's greatness they're completely overwhelmed by the excitement of the fact that Hashem exists so that's a completely different experience of greatness but what we're doing with that is we're trying to create some kind of an understanding in our own reality of Hashem's greatness we can't understand Hashem but at least we could try and understand Hashem's greatness and then you get to the Shema and you realize that if you really want to be able to connect with an understanding of Hashem's greatness, then your understanding can't be moichin de katnos. The intellect that you're using can't be trapped in the small-mindedness of this world. There has to be like a release. In the same way as the difference between the person who's teaching somebody who knows far less than them versus when they're studying on their own. In the same way as the difference between the brain when it is plugged into mediating my behavior or my emotional outbursts versus the brain when it is able to contemplate Hashem's greatness. In the same way, if I want to appreciate the greatness of Hashem, I need to unplug from all the things that I think are so great about this world. Because if I really think that the best thing ever is fill in the blanks, I'm sure everybody has their thing that they'll fill in, this person's going to say the best thing ever is uh, lying on a beach in, in uh, some Caribbean island. And for the next person, the best thing ever is to have a, a properly done medium rare steak. And for the next person, the best thing ever is to be able to get the, the latest version of some technology. As long as that's my frame of reference, I'm locked into the smallness of this world. Can't really appreciate godliness. Because the times allocated for prayer our times are moichin de gadlos in the spiritual realms, meaning to say, a pure intellectual appreciation. Therefore, if we choose to plug in, and we need to know how to do this, and we need to know how to daven properly, and we need to know how to contemplate during the course of the prayers, but then there is the invitation and the possibility of transcending ourselves, moichin de gadlos, getting to an appreciation and understanding that is beyond the here and now, beyond the self, beyond how our voice in the world. The Benoni is getting that. The Benoni is having that experience. The Benoni is escaping self, escaping the world, escaping the things that weigh us down, that worry us, that keep us up at night. The Benoni is escaping thinking about life only in human terms at the point of the davening. Moichin de Gadlus, absolute awareness and consciousness of Hashem. And in that moment, the Benoni could very well imagine that I've broken out of the Earth's orbit, out of the Earth's gravity, and I'm now a free soul. I can connect to Hashem. There's nothing in the world that could stop me. So I've probably got a little bit ahead of myself because I thought we'd get further in the actual text today where we get to what happens when the davening ends. We're not there yet. Let's have a look what happens during the davening because <laughs> that's still where we are. So long introduction page 48 in the tanya and we are just over halfway down the page the first uh, word on the line was the word sha'as on the screen it's the third last line so the first word on the line is sha'as we're going to go again from the middle of the line which is vegam vegam lemato in addition to the fact that hashem has set up the world in such a way that the times designated for davening are times of moichin de gadlus in the supernal realms, the gam le mato, so that reflects down here in our human reality that it is shasa koisha l'chol adam, it is an appropriate time. Koisha means a little bit more than appropriate, it's kind of the ideal time. L'chol adam, for any person who chooses to try. So the Benoni doesn't just try. The Benoni is invested in this every single day. There's not a day that goes past where the Benoni's davening is 
ah, I'm just not in the mood today. Tomorrow I'll do better. But every one of us has the opportunity. Chabad Sheloi Lashem. That this is an opportunity for us to completely connect Chabad, which is Chochma Bin Adas, the three faculties of intellect, to Hashem. That's the invitation of the Shema time period. And of course, the prayer is a template that we're supposed to use in order to maximize the opportunity. But, but the point is that this is the time where Hashem is giving us an invitation and saying, you could, if you chose to, bind your intellect with me. If you choose to. And that's not wistful and it's not just because I feel like it. That would be focused and it would require contemplation. But the invitation is there. And if you want to understand a little bit more about what contemplation means, he tells us. The key word of here is laha'amik. Laha'amik comes from the word amok, which means deep. So to contemplate deeply. 48. It means to com- contemplate deeply. Da'atoi, using the faculty of Das, which is a very specific part of the intellect. What's the nature of Das? So we learned earlier, if you, if you recall in chapter 3, we learned that Chochmah, Bina and Das are the three phases of intellect or the three elements of intellect. And Das is where we shift from theoretical knowledge to applied knowledge or to integrated knowledge. For example... You know the old joke that they make, the difference between knowledge and wisdom, or wisdom and knowledge? You know, you know that joke? Knowledge is the fact that you know that a tomato is a fruit. And wisdom is not putting it in a fruit salad. So what that's really saying is, knowledge, what people call knowledge, that's like bina. Bina, I know this information, it's theoretical information. Das is how it applies and integrates in our lives. So that's why we're saying, lahamik datoi. That the contemplative experience of the Shema is to be very deep, very deeply meditative, very deep in, in the content. It's not just superficial content. Oh, Hashem is great. Move on. It's to unpack that, analyze it. What do we mean when we say Hashem is great? Why is the word great? Maybe there are other words that you use in other pl- parts of the davening, like exalted. And what's the symbolism of great, etc. So you, you get into this deep contemplative state of, of unpacking and understanding what these things are. And then uh, it's what, with which faculty? With da'atoi, with the element of intellect that allows me to make this personal. And that's the key of the Shema, to make it personal. I'm not just sitting here thinking, Hashem is great, Hashem is one, you know, whatever the particular catchphrases are that we associate with the prayers. It's to make it da'as. This is real. It's real to me. What does it mean when something is real? So here's an example. You tell a child, don't touch the stove, it's hot. Well, it would be neg- negligent parenting if you then left the kid in the kitchen with a hot stove. I'm talking about a little kid. <laughs> because a child is not capable of abstract das. Just because you told them a concept doesn't mean they know how to apply it. Adults have a more developed, mature kind of da'as. So you could tell an adult something, and there's a greater chance. There's no guarantee. Tell, a, <laughs> tell an adult on the box, smoking kills, and they'll smoke. <laughs> so it's not automatic that just because you're an adult, you have a mature mind, you, you integrate all the information that's presented to you. But it's guaranteed that a child doesn't, a young child doesn't. But once the child touches the stove, and I'm not suggesting you do this at home, but God forbid the child touches the stone, then it's das. From that moment and on, that child knows that this is real. Stoves are really dangerous. You don't have to lecture any further. So when we say das, that's, it's not just that I conceptually believe that Hashem is great and all-powerful and infinite. It's starkly real to me. It's my reality. It's mine like the burnt hand is that child's consciousness. So the time of the Shema is an opportunity for us to have this deep, deep, deep contemplation. In the case of the Benoni, they have that contemplation. As a result of which, they feel something, which we'll talk about in Mitzvah Shem next time. They, they feel this tremendous awakening. And then we've got to say, and what happens after that? But, but right now we're analyzing that during the course of the prayer experience, the Benoni is so switched on 
so connected, so awake, so alert, that they feel as if they could be a tzaddik.